Welcome to Dr. Bethune's Philosophy of Justice panel discussion. Please welcome our moderator, the Honorable Alexis Herman, former U.S. Secretary of Labor and President of the Dorothy Irene Height Education Foundation. Thank you so much for your introduction. And I am delighted to uh, be here this morning with all of you uh, in this most important symposium today, celebrating the 85th anniversary of the National Council of Negro Women and paying special attention and giving special tribute to our esteemed founder, uh, Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune. And I'm very grateful to uh, our president, our leader, the chair of the National Council of Negro Women, Dr. Janetta Cole for her vision uh, to call us, to summon us into this historical moment to reflect, but more importantly, as she has said, to project the vision for the future that we must embrace if we are going to continue to ensure justice for all of our people. I am so delighted that I have a very distinguished panel this morning. I am joined by none other than first, Barbara Onwine, uh, Attorney Onwine. I've always called Barbara the lawyer for the people. I've had the pleasure of working with her uh, throughout the years, uh, and especially when I, when I served in office. She is now the president and founder of the Transformative Justice Coalition. And she is renowned for her contributions, of course, when it comes to ensuring justice for all of our people. She was there for the passage of the landmark Civil Rights Act of 1991. She was very active, of course, for the reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act in 2006. I could spend the rest of this time that we have talking about all of her accomplishments. She's also a radio host now of Igniting Change, but we're always so grateful to always have her with us, bringing her wisdom and her experience. And so, Attorney Onwine, we welcome you this morning. Uh, Attorney Onwine is joined by Dr. Ashley uh, Preston. Now, Dr. Preston is the author, curator, and lecturer in African-American studies at the University of Florida. She is a proud graduate of uh, Howard University, but we are especially pleased that she is with us today because she has served and is serving as the director of the Mary McLeod Bethune Foundation National Historic Landmark. She has made the study of Dr. Bethune's life uh, her passion. And we have benefited so much from her historical study of Dr. Bethune's life. And so we're grateful that she is going to share with us her perspective on Mary McLeod Bethune uh, in Florida. Uh, she's written a book about it and she's going to talk to us about the legacy of Dr. Bethune and her place in history. And I'm always so proud to welcome African-American women who have studied our history. And so we're so grateful, Dr. Preston, that you are with us. And lastly, of course, I want to present Bishop Leah Daughtry, strategist, organizer, activist, author, and theologian. Of course, I call her my super shiro mentee <laughs> because I have literally uh, watched Bishop Daughtry uh, just throughout the years, from her young adult formative years to the place that she occupies now uh, in our country. She now serves as the presiding prelate of the House of the Lord Churches, and she is also a principal of all these things. It is a strategic planning LLC, a project management firm that really helps to build partnerships uh, for the common good. I, of course, have to salute her for what she has done as the co-convener of Power Rising, uh, bringing together young African-American women to ensure that they are active in this whole conversation of, 
of justice and equity today. And I would be remiss if I didn't say that she has served as the uh, former chief of staff at the Department of Labor when I was there. Uh, she has been the chief of staff at the Democratic National Committee. And she bears the uh, title still of having been the only chief executive officer of not one, but two uh, Democratic National uh, Conventions. Uh, we're going to hear from her and uh, her theological perspective on this whole question of justice and what it means today, particularly uh, from the faith community's perspective. But I want to begin with you, Dr. Preston. I want you to tell us about the uh, two books that you've authored on Mary McLeod Bethune and help us to put her legacy in context as we talk about justice. And I want you to build on that and help us to better understand the lessons, the strategies that she laid out so many years ago and how they are applicable, especially for us today. So welcome to all of you and Dr. Preston, I now turn it over to you. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here today. Um, to celebrate 85 years of Mrs. Bethune's wonderful organization. Um, you know, yesterday, as I was preparing for today, I watched um, a couple of videos um, of interviews of a woman by the name of Ms. Debbie Johnson Roundtree. Oh, Debbie, yes. <laughs> we love her. I just, yes. You know, she was talking about how Ms. Bethune was such a visionary. And she said she was dreaming of things that Black women shouldn't have even been dreaming about in that moment. And it just really struck me of how we are really standing upon her shoulders um, in this very historic moment that we're living in uh, with the election, um, with our first African-American woman, woman serving as VP, you know, this is really the result of Ms. Bethune's hard work um, and her dedication. And so to tell you a little bit about um, my work, uh, my first book, Mary McLeod Bethune in Florida, Bringing Social Justice to the Sunshine State, uh, was written in 2015. And my next book is actually under contract and it will be looking at her international activism Mm. her work in Haiti, Cuba, mm. Liberia, um, mm. her work as one of the first African-Americans to attend the founding of the United Nations, mm. where she would speak out against colonization. Mm. And so I started this work uh, when I was at Howard, um, started with just volunteering and then taking a job for the National Park Service in her home in D.C., and then I went on to run her home in Daytona Beach for five years before coming to the University of Florida. And so while in Florida, I met all of these people who actually knew Ms. Bethune. And they talked about the impact that she had had on Daytona Beach and Florida overall, even though she was from South Carolina, she spent most of her time in Florida and DC. And so she is there in the Daytona Beach community and she's really a beacon of hope in that community. She starts this school with just a dollar and 50 cent, but it's more than a school. It is a place that is teaching African-Americans how to, to read so that they can pass literacy tests as early as 1920 so that they can have the ability to vote. Um, it is a place in which she opens a hospital. Not being a medical doctor, she opens a hospital in 1911 to serve the community. She creates a better boys program, even though her school is an all girls school. And theologian Howard Thurman would be a part of that better boys program. Mm -hmm. And he talks about the impact that Mrs. Bethune had on his life from his early years. And when she passes away, he's the person that gives her eulogy. And so just to see how his life turns out, to see how influential he goes on to be after getting his start in that all boys program. 
it really gives you an understanding of how she invested in the people that were around her. And that's simply what she did in Florida. And so she starts this work with her school that becomes a college. And then she starts to become involved in the club women's movement with the National Association of Colored Women. And then she goes on, of course, to found NCNW, you know, but we really stand upon her shoulders, all of these historic moments that we celebrate. Um, going back to the Women's Army Corps, this is the yeah. first time that women would serve in the military in roles of nurses. How many times do we look at the involvement of women in the military now and point back to Mrs. Bethune selecting the first 40 Black women in the military? Do those military women know that she was the person that was at the table fighting yeah. for their inclusion? Uh, Mrs. Debbie Roundtree Johnson says, she would hear her on the phone <clears throat> with her cane, banging her cane, <laughs> saying, I want my girls to be involved. I want them to be a part of this. And although um, she talks about being very fearful for entering in entering the military, not really knowing what her role would be, she says that because Mrs. Bethune assured her that she would be there for her, you know, she understood that she had to do it. And so uh, Ms. W, of course, goes on to um, become one of the first African-American women in the military. And then she goes on to be an attorney during the civil rights era. And so all of these people, you know, they are a part of Mrs. Bethune's story. And they really show that even after her passing, her legacy continues through those that she interacted with because she's very much a mentor. And she makes sure that she's not just being at the forefront, but she's also training other people to come up after her. That is so, so powerful. Thank you for setting the tone for us around the legacy of Mary McLeod Bethune. And I have to tell you, I had chills when you called the name of, of Dovey Roundtree. I love Dovey so much. And if you ever wanted to be in a room with Fierce Black women, you, you had to hear Dovey Roundtree and Dorothy Height talk about Mary McLeod Bethune. I mean, those were the moments for people who had women who were her mentees, mm -hmm. who benefited from her leadership. Thank you so much for, for setting that tone for us. And, and as I listen to you, Barbara, I couldn't help but think of you as one of those legacy holders. You too have benefited so much from the work and the legacy of Mary McLeod Bethune. And what I love about your spirit is that you're always so positive. <laughs> You've always hung in there. And, you know, you didn't have a cane to beat like Mary McLeod, but you've been beating all of us over the years, right? With that invisible cane. Tell us, how do you help us not be cynical? How have you done it? How do we continue to ignite this passion for justice that Mary McLeod Bethune carried? Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Secretary. Um, Herman, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Cole and everybody. What a, what a great prank that this is. And I loved hearing that um, historical account. Uh, you know what keeps me positive is I always say when I speak to young people that when Harriet Tubman was making her trips back and forth, risking her life, never knowing what awaited her, that she did that because she saw us. She saw us in her eyes and in her dreams. She knew one day we would be here and that we would carry forth this mission and that we would fight to make not only this country more just, but the world a more just place. And because African-American women, we have no boundaries. We have no boxes. We're constantly constructing 
new and unforeseen possibilities. So it makes me just, you know, happy to be part of that tradition and to know that I'm part of that continuum. You know, when we talk about justice, um, you know, one thing that we always need to keep in mind is that there can be no justice in the presence of pervasive racism. That racism is contrary to any sort of justice and that you can't have democracy without justice because democracy fundamentally is about the free exchange of human beings, the free exchange of ideas, the free engagement of everybody in the political process. So when you have racism, that makes that hard to do, that makes that impossible, or people are trying to block folks, that is absolutely contrary to any form of justice. The, you know, when we talk about justice, I can't help but think about 2020 and uh, the early part of 2021, and to think about the fact that Black women did it, that Black women led the way, that Black women got out there and organized like crazy. When people were telling us that we were wasting our time, uh, that we did what we had to do, what we've always done, and that is to go against the odds and to fight you know, for justice. And so you can't talk about um, justice in America without talking about our criminal injustice system, right? Because it's part of it. Think about it, a world that we live in right now where 1% of all prosecutors are black women, only 1%, where only 3% of all sitting judges are black women. Uh, you know, that just tells you that this system in and of itself is, you know, is not, you know, representative is, and is corrupt and not being representative. But the, beget but the reality is, is that black women, we understand our power of the vote, and we turned out in unprecedented numbers, right? In 2020, um, and we did, uh, you know, organizing that was amazing. Think about it, 90% of all blacks in Philadelphia were registered in 2020. Think about it, during the Senate runoff election, 93% of all blacks registered in Fulton County voted. I mean, that is just amazing. I mean, you have to really look at, you know, the fact that our young people, when I was on the ground for two solid months, uh, you know, leading up to the Senate runoff election, I would talk to the young people and they would tell me the reason why they voted in unprecedented numbers. You have no flip, and I'm just talking about what happened, not, you know, being partisan. You have no flip to blue in Georgia without the young vote. And remember nationwide, African-American young people turned out in 2020 in unheard of numbers. Uh, and the young people, when I would talk to them and say, why did you vote? What was your motivation? They would say, I voted for Ahmaud Arbery, whose the anniversary of his slaying was just, what? Just a few days ago. They would say, I voted for Rayshard Brooks, who was slain in Atlanta by you know the police there uh and they would say that that's why i'm voting because we gotta have change change is critical and they got out there and they did a lot of this work so you know so i you know i see possibilities because people were talking about how the young are apathetic they weren't going to do this and that and our young people turned out like crazy and did an amazing job and remember because of covid a whole lot of folks couldn't go out and do things, but it was the young people who did that canvassing on the ground. It was the young people who made, who used their technological advancements to make so much change. So, you know, I, I see possibilities because people said, what are we going to do? You know, we're in COVID. We can't organize the way we traditionally organize. And the answer to that is that we're going to do it, Mary McDowell. McLeod Bethune did, we're going to do what Dorothy Height did, we're going to do new things, that's what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. And so what we did that I really love is that we taught millions of, Af of voters of all races how to vote absentee, how to vote early. That was us. It wasn't the government. I mean, the government was, was barely reaching some of these state governments, anybody. 
and they weren't trying to in many instances. And right now, because of our success, what are we dealing with, uh, Secretary Herman? We're dealing with unprecedented backlash uh, of voter suppression. 43 states, 253 ugly voter suppression laws, trying to take away early voting, trying to take away absentee ballots, trying to take away drop boxes, all of these things. And so as we talk right now about big ideas, our biggest idea is how we unite as we always do to fight in the moment, to overcome the moment, to make people just say, as they do, they just hit their heads and say, black women, Black women, just look at black women. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you for that. I'm gonna come back to you and ask you for a couple of practical strategies and suggestions as we continue to be odds breakers. When you think about voter suppression in those 43 states that you just, I'm gonna give you a minute to think about that. But if you had to give a charge to the listeners here, what else do we continue to do to ensure that Mary McLeod Bethune's principle of justice uh, continues uh, to roll down in the words, uh, this adultery of like, like a mighty stream, you know, I'm coming to you now to, to, to take it over for us because Barbara Online started preaching on us, okay? <laughs> but you know, you know, in the words of St. Paul, of course, that it takes good deeds as well as faith. And so can you tell us, can you tell us how do you see in this present age and environment, the role of, of faith-based communities to continue this passionate movement of justice that has been core to our history as a people? Do you still see faith leaders having that same degree of, of passion and commitment uh, that Attorney Anwan just clearly uh, talked about? So the floor is yours. You do with that what you want to. Well, thank you, Secretary Herman. And it is always good to be with you. As she has said, she has been my mentor for many, many years and is still the first place I go uh, when I need help, su support, advice, pushing, pulling. Uh, she is my touchstone and I appreciate and love her so very much. And of course, Sister Arnwine, Sister Preston, it's good to see you. And I so enjoyed that history lesson you gave us. And Barbara, you know how much I love you and your, and your uh, energy and the work that you're doing. Of course, Dr. Cole, who is the epitome of black womanhood. I mean, what is there, what can you not say about her and the way that she is moving our beloved council forward is just amazing. So, you know, when we talk about uh, faith institutions, the black church, and I wanna use that term, the black church, but encompassing our various faith traditions. Some of us are Muslim, some of us are Jewish, some of us are Buddhists, but when I talk about church, I don't mean, I don't want you to take that as an insult, but I mean you too. Uh, the thing about our, our, our beloved faith institutions is when you look at Black communities, there are two institutions that are constant and consistent in every, uh, in every one of our communities. That's, those are schools and churches. You can find them in every place where you find Black people. The thing about the Black religious institution is that we are probably the last independent organizations in our communities. We're not beholden to anybody. We don't owe anybody except maybe the bank for the mortgage. And we answer only to a higher power, which is what guides us, uh, undergirds us, and informs our work. And that higher power is named God, Allah, you, you call it, but is the creator of justice and is the one from whom justice springs. And so when we think about how we move in the world, I think the role of the black church is threefold. One is inspiration to remind our people that they deserve justice not because that they're inherently good or bad, but because justice is a God-given right. It is God-ordained and they are worthy, they are valuable, and they deserve to have justice 
in their lives. The principles of equality, of fairness that Mrs. McLeod, uh, Mrs. Bethune talked about are part of the ethos of our faith statements. Yeah. That we are worthy and God designed us with value. God designed us with God's own breath to be people who are worthy, who reflect God's vision, who reflect God's values, and who God wants to be treated fairly, equally, and with justice. So the church serves as inspiration for those moments when we're tired and we done been on one march too many and there's one killing too many and we don't know where the end is going to be. The church serves as the inspiration point to say, keep on going, let's run on a little while longer because this is worth fighting for. Secondly, the church serves as a point of education. Our leaders are trusted in community and I don't just mean the pastor. I mean the, the, the auxiliary heads, the people who run the usher board, the people who teach the Sunday school. These are trusted voices in our community and we have a unique role to help educate people, not just about the great truths of scripture, but also about their own history and about their role in society and about where how the society is treating us. We have a responsibility as a purveyors of education, as trusted leaders to bring people into the church and to use our influence to take education outside the four walls of the church so that the people that we influence know that the information we're bringing can be trusted that the church is some place that they can go to get information or at least be able to connect with the right sources to get the information that they need. That's important in this time of COVID when people are trying to decide vaccine. I don't know. The church is a place where that can convene leaders in a trusted way to say, get your information and make the decision that's best for you. So the church serves as a point of inspiration, a point of education, and thirdly, a point of mobilization. A place where people can, uh, that, that we can press the levers and say, y'all come on, we march in the city hall. We're letter writing a campaign. We're supporting the NAA Legal Defense Force. We're supporting transformative justice. We're trying to get people out of, off of death row. We're fighting for voting rights. We can mobilize people in a way that few organizations can because of our long history in the Black community of fighting for the things that are right. Now that I know there's a lot of people who say, well, the church isn't in the church, but there are more who aren't than more who are than who aren't. The leaders who are stepping forward, the leaders who are providing what we need in terms of inspiration, education, and mobilization, that has been a consistent thread and a consistent theme in the black church. And I always like to remind people that the church is where leaders were born nurtured and pushed forward at a time when we didn't have any other institutions to do that. The church was, what that is why when you look at reconstruction, many of the senators who came out of the reconstruction period came out of the church because the church was where you got your first speaking engagement on Sunday at the Easter program doing your recitation. The church was where someone helped you with your skills in terms of how you deal with people. I always tell people, if you can navigate the black church, the Democratic Party is nothing. Because the church has more politics and relationships that need to be navigated than any place else. The church is where we nurtured and built leaders when we didn't have any place else to do that. And because of that, we have a unique role in the history of the black community and we have demonstrated our ability to educate, to mobilize, and to inspire our people toward a higher vision of themselves. Wow, that's that's very, very powerful, very powerful. I want to do a quick follow-on, and then I want to go to Dr. Uh, Preston. What would be your take on the church's role in engaging especially young people? I, I was struck by... Barbara's passionate uh, commentary on their activism, uh, particularly in this recent election. How, what do you see as the church's role in helping us to get more of our young people uh, in that tradition that you just so beautifully articulated? You know, I think it's a, it's a combination of 
ensuring that we our doors are open and welcoming for young people to come in and to feel part of the church. But there are, I can give you a list of 20 churches where young people are leading the way and where they are bringing new voices into, we're conscious of the fact that our churches will die if we don't have young people. But that's a refrain from every generation. Every generation has to bring, it has to empower and allow young people to lead, to grow in order for institutions to move on. This is not new. This is in every single cycle that you say, do we have enough young people? Where are the young people? Are they leading the way? Here's what COVID I think has done for us. It has moved us out of uh, what I call the idolization of our buildings and our structures and allowed us to take the ministry that we have, the advocacy that we normally do and move it out into a way that more people can be engaged and involved. And that has necessarily meant that our young people who understand all this technology <laughs> and who <laughs> understand you know, this, this platform and that platform and digital media, their leadership has been elevated inside of the church mm -hmm. because we no longer can plan ministry, just me and the deacon board. I better have my young people there. Otherwise, it's not going to get on Zoom or StreamYard or whatever else I'm doing. So the ministry team, just as a practical matter, have had to expand. And that in itself helps to move. The more young people see themselves, the more they know that they are welcome that they are appreciated, that their ideas are respected, and that they can lead and that we trust them to lead us forward. Mm -hmm. Well said, well said. You know, I, I want to pivot from that commentary to you, uh, Dr. Preston. You know, I love Dr. Bethune's uh, last will and testament, the legacy, when she said, I leave you love, I leave you hope. Finally, I leave you a responsibility for our young people. She was so passionate about educating our youth. But I was struck by actually the personal conversation uh, we had uh, in preparation for this panel. And I want you to take a few moments to share with our audience so that we can inspire and motivate them in this call for action that is still needed more about the personal characteristics of Mary McLeod Bethune. You know, she was from the rural South. <laughs> she had a meager education, but she made such a, a huge impact. Talk to us more about those characteristics of her and her ability to move people and issues because the reality is we can all play a role. We all have something that we can do to continue this justice tradition. But I was struck just reflecting on this black woman <laughs> and her personal characteristics that we need to think about for a moment uh, in terms of ourselves. So can you just share with us some of what you've talked about in terms of her personal characteristics, that was a huge motivator. So when I came to Daytona in 2013 um, and was there for five years, I met all of these people who knew Miss Bethune. And for me, that was just really transformative because as a researcher, as a person who had been studying her life, doing their dissertation and all of these articles, then you meet people who tell you the personal side of Ms. Bethune, you know, how she wouldn't back down, how she, she never took no for an answer, how she would ask you for something and she would come back and, and ask you again if you said no. You know, her grandson, how she would try to steer him into the right direction and how she was just such this, this large presence but in Daytona, she would sit on her front porch and welcome people to come to talk with her and, and just share with her. And so, you know, she was just this amazing person um, that was always willing to take the time. And she always paid attention to details. And that's a major thing about her life that really struck me. Um, there's a man by the name of Mr. Harold Lucas. And last night I had uh, the opportunity to be on a program with him. He was launching a foundation and he's launching this foundation because 
he was a student of Miss Bethune's. Her, um, his dad had actually started the business program. And so he's now almost 90 years old, starting a foundation just as she had done um, because he was influenced by her work. But just going back to uh, Mrs. Bethune, I'm gonna give you a quote um, that she once said, faith is the first factor in a life devoted to service. Without faith, nothing is possible. With it, nothing is impossible. Faith in God is the greatest power, but great too is faith in oneself. Faith. You know, people ask me, you know, what was her secret sauce? <laughs> what is it that allowed her, someone from Maysville, South Carolina, 15th of 17 children, her parents had been enslaved, her brothers and sisters had been enslaved, how is it that she would go on to work with presidents? How is it that she would go on to be known internationally, to be, you know, in these various places? Um, but it was really her faith in God and her faith in herself. If you listen to her, she always had a plan. You know, she could always articulate her goals and what she wanted to accomplish. And at times she was able to convince people to follow her even when they were reluctant. When she started NCNW in 1935, in the midst of the Great Depression, there were those who said we didn't need another women's organization. There were those who said right now is not the right time. But some of those same people, Mary Church Terrell being one of them, who was a bit unsure about the organization, they would then join her and become a part of it and still support her because they knew that if she was a part of it, that she was leading it, that she had a plan and that she will always carry out that plan and that it would be successful. And so I would just say some things to take away from her life is that we should always be able to articulate our vision and that we should also um, never be afraid to start something even if we don't have all of the moving parts. Think about 1904, she's starting a school with a dollar and 50 cents. She literally only has a dollar and 50 cent. The building is $11. Some of us would have looked at that and said, hey, I don't even have the money to do this thing. And so as we are moving forward, thinking about change, we should just remember that we can't be deterred by not having it all together. We should start this anyway. We should do this anyway. We should become involved in the movement despite the situation because that's exactly what she did. She was also a mentor. There is a woman by the name of Dr. Cleo Higgins, who was her protege. She would go on to be a VP at Bethune-Cookman. She would also be a national president of Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated. And so Mrs. Bethune was the person who helped her to get her PhD. She was the person to make sure that she had the funding. And so those types of things, making sure that we're mentoring others, making sure that we are giving back, as, as um, Bishop um, Daughtry talked about, encouraging our young people. You know, she gave her whole life to young people, starting a school at 29 years old with a very young son. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm really inspired by everything that she accomplished. And, you know, I think as far as looking at her relevance today, we really have to critically begin to study her life. There are so many lessons within her work. There's so many things that we can take away and we can apply them to today if we would just become more interested in the work. And it's not just Miss Bethune, it's Dr. Carter G. Woodson as we're celebrating Black History Month. You know, we, we think about Black History Month and we, we celebrate it sometimes without even understanding that before Dr. Woodson came on the scene, people were saying that Black people had no history, had not contributed anything to society. And Dr. Woodson said, no, not only have we contributed, here's the research, here are the books, here are the articles, here's the association, the association that's still around today. And so between Dr. Woodson and Ms. Bethune and others, you know, we really have a roadmap to success. If we think about justice and what that looks like, you know, they have already done these things. They've already been a part of making sure that there was equal access. They've already been a part of working with presidents and holding those presidents accountable. I won't even tell you the, 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 the uh, letters I've read between her and President Roosevelt. 
in which she's telling him, do not take the black vote for granted. You know, she not only stands beside the president, but she holds him accountable at times when it's not popular. And so those are just some of the things I think that we can take away from her life and that we can really, you know, we can allow ourselves to sit with those things and we can study them and we can become better people because of them. Thank you. Thank you so much. And as you talk about taking time to study and reflect, we know how much Dr. Bethune believed in the power of education. And Bishop Daughtry talked about uh, point two that I love, that that's a, that's a role for the church still uh, as a part of inspiration, education, and mobilization. But Attorney Arnawan, I want to come to you. And, and Kyla, I don't know where we are. I am just so caught up in this fabulous panel. And I know we've got to go to Q&A, but I've got to ask um, Barbara Arnwine. As you listen to uh, Dr. Preston, and as I reflect on the call to action, the need still to use Bishop Daughtry's word for us to continue to mobilize, you know, Dr. Bethune said that the principle of justice is fundamental and it must be exercised if the people of this country are to rise to the highest uh, and their best. So it, it's still a question of how do we mobilize? And as you talked about those 43 states, uh, we could hone in on so many justice issues today. But I want to stay with that theme on voter suppression that you talked about. And if you just went there for a few moments, what would you tell us? Well, I would say the biggest idea that we need to embrace is that we must create and operate permanent voting rights infrastructure. Can't just be around elections. It's got to be permanent 24-7, 365 days a year. And we got to have that kind of commitment uh, to the political process. That is not uh, just when there's an election uh, that we should mobilize. That we need to have permanent voter infrastructure. Permanent, uh, and there's nothing more than critical. You know, there's so many interconnections between everything we've been talking about. Um, because, you know, in fighting this voter suppression, what is one of their targets? I mentioned early voting. One of their biggest targets is getting rid of Sunday voting because they hate souls to the polls voting. Right now in Georgia, they have a piece of legislation that is pending and will be voted on Monday or Tuesday. And the purpose of the legislation is to get rid of Sunday voting. Everybody listening should make one call at least, and you should talk about what's called HB 531 in Georgia. And you should call the speaker of the legislature. His name is David Ralston. The telephone number is 404-656-5020. That's 404. 656-5020, we just did that. That could be powerful, my sisters. Never underestimate the power that you have in your finger, in your voice. Uh, you know, we gotta understand our power. So that's one thing, you know, build permanent infrastructure. Second, let's take some action right now. The next one is that we need to organize if we're gonna build this permanent infrastructure. Then we got to organize within our existing organizations and within new organizations to really monitor, you know, what's going on with the political uh, process. So we need to organize and create our own local, you know, voter protection clubs or work within the organizations that already do that. The other thing is that we need massive, ooh, Dr. Dr. Dow, you talked about this and, Pre uh, and Dr. Preston has been say, uh, teaching us how it goes. And that is we need massive community education. The one thing we showed in 2020 is how powerful we are at educating our communities. Remember that absentee voting, the average rejection rate 
for absentee voting, it's around 9% to 11%. And when we started off in the beginning of absentee voting, that was what was happening in many states like North Carolina. By the time we finished, absentee voting rate rejection nationwide was less than 1%. That's us. And that's our community educators. That's our getting out there and showing people you got to use the right ink, showing people how to sign, showing people what, you know, how to get around all of these obstacles. We did that. I don't want there to be any confusion. We're capable. We have that ability. Our young people, you know, got on those platforms uh, and used their technology, but also they walked and they knocked on doors because a lot of us live in internet deserts. We have no online ca capability. So they went straight to people's homes and did that education. We got on phones and we called people, we got on radio and we used our traditional outreach ways. And then we got to engage in massive. That's the only way we can do two things. We got two big jobs this year, folks. We got to kill and destroy this voter suppression movement. We got to make sure that we continue, I guess it's three, that we continue our fight against the criminal injustice system. And we're winning that fight, by the way. I know that there's a lot, I can't go into it, but I can tell you that we've decreased the black uh, incarceration population by 33%. We did that. That's the Black Lives Matters movement. That's electing progressive pros prosecutors, a whole lot of other stuff. But I also, want people to know that we need to use, you know, where we can use online, we should use online schooling, create freedom schools, you know, again, do those kind of things, invest in our young people, invest in our young people. I can't say if there was one refrain, if I could put up a billboard, it would be invest in our young people because we under estimate their capabilities. We denounce, we talk bad about young folks because we don't understand who we're talking about. We don't even know who we're talking about. So invest in young people. The last thing is the hard one, but it's the most important also. And that's just learn how to coordinate with each other. You know, the visions are everywhere. Uh, when, uh, when Dr. Preston was talking about folks saying, you don't need another organization. Uh, I was thinking about so much of what we've learned over the last couple of years about those issues. And I think that one of the things I love about Melanie Campbell, Helen Butler, you know, Latasha Brown, all these bad, amazing sisters is who are the big organizers in this field is because they believe in coordination. They believe in unity. They believe in working together. So there's nothing more important than that. We can't be lone wolves. We can't believe our organizations are the only ones. We got to understand what we did so well in 2020 was we combined our resources and we had one common mission. The third thing we got to do this year is redistricting. You can't do redistricting effectively. That data would be out on September 30th. It's going to be everything to win the redistricting fight. That's why we got to pass HR 4. Uh, the John Lewis uh, Voting Rights Advancement Act. Uh, but redistricting is gonna be so key and our groups have to be involved. And that's why if you don't have a local organization, you gotta create it uh, because we can't be silent on redistricting. And so a lot of that's gonna be done in the latter part of this year, but a lot in the early part of 2022. So I just wanna, those are some of the fast ones that I can give you. I could go on, but those are the quick ones I would give. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I mean, that, those are great areas of clear focus where we have to come together. And I'm, I'm so glad you raised the criminal justice issue yes. and the impact in particular of what the mobilization and the organization has had yes. uh, on incarceration and that we are on a downward trend. And it's happening because we've got all of our young people, we've got the faith-based community so clearly focused. And as I, as I listened in particular, and Kyle, I'm gonna get ready to come to you uh, now for questions from the audience. And if you don't have them, I have at least 10 more. Uh, I, I just want to applaud Dr. Cole again for taking the council into this great new area of focus and making it about an intergenerational conversation and action and, and her recognition 
that we can't do anything uh, without the involvement, especially uh, of our young people. And so as you call the names of all of these terrific women, uh, it occurred to me that uh, it's a new mindset that we all have to be very clear about. Well, yeah. It's gonna be needed as we continue to press forward. Uh, Carla, are you there uh, with questions from the audience? Yes, I am. Thank you, Secretary Herman. <laughs> <laughs> so our first question from the audience, how can we protect the, our communities better from those who have the power to even change laws to their interests? That, that, that's a very good question. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to go first to Bishop Daughtry on this because she is a woman, of course, of uh, faith and considerable political influence. So uh, how can we protect our communities uh, from those who are clearly not on the point uh, that Barbara Anwan has been talking about? How would you respond to that, Bishop Daughtry? Well, I, I would offer that um, part of it is it, too often in our communities, we elect people and then we walk away. We do not do the continuing work that our political system requires of going back, of advocating, of checking on them. And so part of this is if, you've ele if you have been involved in electing someone or if your candidate didn't win, remember, we have to help our folks remember that these people work for us. They don't work for some mysterious, we elected them, we gave them a job. I have never worked on any job, and Secretary Herman can attest, where you get hired and then the boss never comes back to say, where's the project? How you doing? What happened? And if your performance isn't good, you get fired. And our, in our American system, uh, 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 election day is the day that people's contract get renewed or they get terminated. So one piece of this is our own responsibility to stay engaged, to check on these people. If your elected official doesn't know your name, you're not doing your job. Be in their face. They need to know what you care about, what you don't care about, and that you are paying attention. Now, if you're living in a district where the person in office is not who you wanted and they are unresponsive, then you start your committee of one and join with the next committee of one and the next committee of one to fire them on their next yeah. contract renewal date. We have to be in their faces. They work for us. I say it all the time. They are not removed from our community. We hired them. Let's fire them if they're not going to be responsive. Mm -hmm. Very good. <laughs> and real basic. <laughs> basic. Real basic. Real basic. Okay, Kyla, the next question. Thank you. And due to time, we have, we have time for one more question. Okay, great. How important is knowing and understanding the Bill of Rights to you? And what age do you recommend we start to educate our youth with the Bill of Rights? Well, one question, but I, I have to let both panelists answer this question because one is clearly an educator uh, and the other is, is a justice advocate on the front lines all about the Bill of Rights. So I'm gonna ask both Barbara and uh, uh, Dr. Preston to uh, quickly answer that question. Bob, uh, Ashley, why don't you go first, dear, as an educator? So I would, I would just like to take on the part of the question asking about how young. Mm -hmm. um, I think that sometimes we look at our youth and we think that they won't understand things. Um, my son is two and mm -hmm. I read books to him all the time that I know he may not know what I'm saying. Um, I'm reading books to him about HBCUs. Um, his name is Carter. I'm reading books to him that include Dr. Carter G. Woodson because that's who he's named after. Mm -hmm. And he may not know now, but over time he will understand. So I don't think that there is a, a, an age that is too young to begin to start to explain the political process. 
just as we break things down for our young people on other issues, we need to start doing that uh, when it, when it um, relates to um, political issues. We can do it. And um, I, that's just my take on it. I think we should start with them very young um, because if we don't teach them, they will learn somewhere else and they may not get the right understanding when it's taken to someone else. So I would just say there is no age that is too young. And the last thing I would say is that um, being in the state of Florida, um, the amendments that we have in Florida, they are hard to understand sometimes, very hard, even for an adult, even for a person with a PhD, but we have to go to the experts. And so I've invited experts at times to come to my church um, via Zoom to explain these things and break them down because there are people in the community that do understand and we can lean in on their expertise when it's time so that we can not only educate one person, but educate everyone overall, children included. So I would say there's no age that's too young and to begin to lean in on the experts. And thankfully we're sitting here with some experts on this panel. I just wanna quickly say thank you all so much for inviting me. And this has been a fruitful conversation. I'm so excited about NCNW and the direction in which it's going. And this has just been powerful. Thank you. Thank Let's you. Take us, one more minute. Thank you. Okay, Barbara. Yes, uh, quickly. Uh, the first thing is that on knowing the Bill of Rights, you've got to know the history and why those Bill of Rights look the way they do. I mean, people talk about the Second Amendment all the time. You really need to understand the history of the Second Amendment and its context and why it was in, uh, in, uh, created. Same with the first. But also, you got to understand the Reconstruction Amendment. And when the Constitution literally was a new, renewed, and what the 13, 14, 15 were designed to do, you got to understand, you know, the uh, that there not only do you have your federal constitution, you got to know your state constitution. I mean, we've been using state constitutions over and over in our litigation now because I am a litigator, right? Uh, you know, by nature, and we have to, you know, use, you know, really understand because what I understand is that people just don't know that. And the last thing is international comparisons. The U.S. does not have the best constitutions in the world. There are better ones. I, I know people are saying, she got to be kidding me. Yes, there are. Think about it. We are 75th in the world in women's representation. 75th. That means there are 74 countries that do better than us. Why? Because they have better constitutions when it comes to representation for women in particular and for other, you know, uh, minority groups. There's a lot in there. So I, you know, I just urge people, you know, to become, as Dr. Preston said, to become students. I urge people to become, as Dr. Daughtry said, to be mobilizers and organizers. We got to do this. We can. We're beautiful. We got that power. That's what God gave us. Thank you. Thank you. And my thanks very much to this esteemed panel. You've been terrific. Uh, my, my heartfelt thanks again to Dr. Cole for her visionary leadership, to Janice Mathis, our esteemed executive director for the hard work to pull all of this together. And I sign off with Mary McLeod Bethune's words that I so love from her legacy. I leave you the challenge of developing confidence in one another because we all stand on her shoulders. And we have to continue to do the work to have that boldness and that courage to ensure justice for all of our people. God bless you and have a great day. Thank you.